Well, thank you so much, uh, Carlos and Dennis, for applauding for me. Uh, my name is Niels Powells, and I'm uh, co-presenting with my uh, good friend and colleague, Dennis Klein. Together uh, with a few other business partners, we own a virtual production studio in Amsterdam. Um, and we've been asked by Row Visual, the LED manufacturer and supplier of the XR stage over here, to do a bit of a hands-on presentation. So uh, we call it a, a technical breakdown, could also be a more a creative breakdown. It doesn't really matter. It's a breakdown of a few projects we've done uh, over the last couple of months. For us, it's a really special uh, week, actually, because um, we turned one this week. Yay. Thank you. Tada! A little movie about uh, how we set up exactly one year ago. Um, we have a, a studio in, uh, in Amsterdam. It's the eldest studio, the film studio, eldest film studio in the Netherlands. And uh, we're running the most, the, well, the newest technology in filmmaking there. So that's a nice little contrast um, happening there. Um, as you can see, it was a, um, you know, building these studios is a time consuming uh, process. Uh, but once done correctly and when using the right equipment, it's a really powerful tool in the toolbox. This is what it looks like when you walk in, and this is our studio. On the left, you see our brain bar slash volume control. Um, and then there's a large back wall um, consisting of row panels, uh, hence us being here on their behalf, uh, of 14 meters wide and five and a half meters high, which is designed from a film perspective. Um, Dennis, myself, and all of our partners have a film background and come from making films and uh, this technology and also making commercials. So we had to find a bit of a sweet spot to allow everybody to film in that space. Though it can be enlarged um, and it can change a little bit uh, based on the specs. And these are it's actually pretty neat because I love technology. That's our server rack and the back of the screen, which is always impressive. Uh, that's enough for this. So, um, there's ample working space also for, I mean, the physical crew working obviously in front of the LED screen. And I think, Niels, you mentioned the, 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 the ratio of the screen. We went for a slightly higher screen because we see there's, there are a lot of studios that have like very wide screens, but when you go backwards a little bit, I think the height is something that you shoot out of sooner exactly. almost than the, the width. So we kind of specifically yep. chose this um, height. So height these width. are the, the measurements, 14 by five and a half, and then we have a movable screen of three by three, which you can position anywhere in the studio for reflections or uh, for a B cam, for example. Um, the ideal solution or the ideal end result is that you walk out of our studio after a day of shooting with final pixel, meaning you go home and there's nothing left to do to your shot, uh, except a bit of grading, hopefully. And this is obviously the ideal end result. Quite often you still need to do a little bit of VFX, like Pim had to, uh, to wipe out uh, the, uh, the, the arm, and we had, uh, we're going to show you later, um, a bar that's in between a reflection. So there's sometimes there's still a little bit of work to do, but ideally you go home with final pixel. So what is virtual production? I work echt voor geen meter. So virtual production um, is the process where the physical world and the digital world meet. That is a pretty broad term, um, and it's a definition that refers to any technique that allow filmmakers to plan, imagine, or complete some kind of filmic element, typically with the aid of digital tools. There you go. I couldn't memorize that, so I had to read it from them. Um, what we do, we specialize in, in, in camera VFX, is a part of virtual production. Previous is virtual production, TechVis is virtual production, yeah. Uh, performance capture, like mocap, is virtual production. Simulcam is virtual production. Green screen shooting is virtual production. However, we do in-camera VFX, which most people associate at the moment with the term virtual production. They see LED walls, they think Unreal Engine, 
So right now the term virtual production is pretty, you know, pretty much in camera visual effects. So whatever term we use throughout my presentation and Dennis' presentation is what we do. Next slide, please. Um, it's not new. This is a clip from North by Northwest from 1959. And what they did over here, and actually the process is pretty similar to what we do, because that crew in 1959 had to think about how to integrate a foreground, the actor, with a background. And here they use, obviously they don't use LED panels because they didn't exist back then, they use rear projection. But the line is very similar. The process is very similar. They took a bit of dirt, a couple of rocks, a, a, a fan to make a bit of wind and a bit of dust fly up, and the actor falls and, and the, the plane comes in, and it's, well, I kind of believe it, even though it's from 1959. But that technique evolved, and we have a lot of examples of rear projection dating back to, you know, even before 1959, uh, to what I think is one of the best examples of rear projection uh, in Oblivion, where they created a massive, massive stage with tons of projectors and uh, actors walking around it. It's really a beautiful piece of work. But right now, obviously, we have LED panels. And LED stands for light emitting diode. That means that, au contraire to projection, we actually emit light into the set and onto the actors. So LED can create almost every color. That color falls into your set. You have a dynamic background and you have all the reflections already coming into your set. So whether you're an actor or whether it's a car or it doesn't matter, those reflections are in fact real and therefore don't no longer need to be added in a process after the shooting. Hence the term in-camera visual effects. Um, there's a couple of routes to take. Um, obviously, Unreal Engine 3D is by far the most exciting and, uh, and, and nicest one from a technical standpoint. Not always necessary. So we can do, um, you can do 2D. Uh, that can be a static image or a moving uh, a clip, a plate. Um, then the next option is, for example, 2.5D, where you take that two, 2D image, you cut it up in layers. In this uh, example, the background, which is the clouds and the sky, are separated from the foreground, and you can create uh, a kind of a fake parallax effect in that. You have a little bit more control over what's happening on your set compared to 2D, but not as much as compared to full 3D. Here, same scene, same lighthouse, completely redesigned in Unreal Engine, and now we can start adding reflections, we can start adding water, we can start moving stuff around, you can shoot this by, well, by kind of uh, early evening, or you can do it you know, early morning. All of that is under control at, in Unreal Engine at the touch of a button if you have prepared it slightly. Um, the whole process of virtual production means there is a shift in process. So where typically you would fix it in post, all of that budget and time planning goes to the front. You spend more time in pre-production and production than in post-production. The same obviously goes for your budget. And this is a very scary part for producers. They need now need to make up their mind on beforehand how they're going to spend their money, where usually they are keen on you know, keeping the money in their pockets and keeping their creativity at the people that don't need to necessarily need to have the creativity at the post-production uh, company. But now we create the content on beforehand. We use it in the set, and therefore um, that whole process needs to change from post-production to pre-production and on-set production. But it also means that the creativity is actually with the people where it needs to be, with the DP, with the director, with the gaffer, even with the makeup department. Everybody can see on set how it looks like and what it should look like, and we can make adjustments right there, right then and there. 
Um, so it's a bit of a, a, a different mindset, a, a change in, in thought process. So when is virtual production slash ICVFX the right choice? And I'll leave that to my uh, esteemed colleague, Dennis. Thank you, Niels. So um, yeah, this is an interesting central question for anyone who wants to work eventually in virtual production or um, with uh, in-camera visual effects, as we, uh, as we mentioned before, um, because this is a question that, that we get a lot. It's, it's a productional question, but it's also a creative question. Um, it's hard to answer this question with one answer because, as we all know, every production is a prototype uh, in one way or another. I mean, um, it's very the, the, the ask is often very uh, custom and very uh, applicable to only that production. But there, there are a few markers that are like interesting to kind of uh, put every case study that I'm about to show you uh, against to see, okay, what benefit did VP offer in this particular case study and why was VP chosen to uh, to be um, the solution to a production challenge or a production problem. So uh, volume or shot count is one of the most common um, markers for um, virtual production in drama productions and it means if you have a lot of screen time instead of going shot per shot and you have your shot per shot cost um, and normally with traditional VFX, for instance, if you have a lot of blue screen or green screen, you have to create an asset and that asset has to be built regardless if it's uh, VFX or virtual production. But instead of having um, per shot cost, you can give that asset into uh, back to the creative stakeholders for virtual production. And the amount of shots that's being made with that asset is no longer uh, adding to the cost. So that's an, that's an important uh, difference. Then um, impossible locations like safety can be, uh, uh, of course, a, a good reason to choose virtual production. Uh, the same goes for efficiency, logistics. Sometimes people can come together at one particular time and you have to shoot a lot of locations. Then it can be beneficial to do that all inside a virtual production studio. Then we have control like light and weather. We will uh, shortly go to a case study in which that was a very important uh, reason to choose virtual production. Then sustainability, although this is something that um, is kind of debatable because we have to know exactly what the whole process would be of a single LED panel being uh, disposed, but also if the studio is working entirely on green power, for instance, instead of gray power and, and things like that. Then we have flexibility, so the reusability, for instance, if you build an asset once, you have multiple seasons, you could reuse a virtual set, obviously, as opposed to a normal set that, of, that uh, often gets uh, either destroyed or stored somewhere. So that, that's um, a very um, obvious uh, benefit. And then cost, although in itself, um, we are always very reluctant to claim virtual production is Cheap, I mean, it can be cheaper or less expensive, um, but it's not a one of the main reasons per se. There's there's a lot of other reasons why virtual production can be interesting. And if you want to do it properly, make a proper breakdown, you should do something like this. Compare the real option against visual effects against virtual production, and then go through all these different markers and then come up with a reason why virtual production can add something to your um, uh, end result. So um, to start off with our first case study, this is um, The Crash. In Dutch, it's called Ramvlucht. Um, it is a um, five uh, episode. It, it's an episodical production with five episodes of 15 minutes. And it's about uh, a real uh, uh, occurrence back in 1992 where when an airplane crashed in one of the neighborhoods close to uh, Amsterdam. And that was a, a, a devastating uh, event. A lot of people lost their lives. And just like in the series Chernobyl, for instance, it, on HBO, it's very much about the aftermath of the disaster. So there's a lot of uh, investigation. There's a lot of uh, journalists diving into the case. And there are a lot of um, scenes taking place in the Dutch Senate and the Dutch House of Representatives, or for the Dutch people, the Eerste Kamer and the Tweede Kamer. Uh, and this is what they look like back in 1992. Um, and of course, one of the things that we realized very early on is how are we going to do these scenes? Because we can choose either to see we can shoot there for real, which was not possible because simply we, we wouldn't get the, the permit to do so 
if we would have gotten the permit to do so, these spaces, they don't look like they did anymore in 1992. So they have been like reconstructed and things like that. Then we have uh, a set build option, which was out of scope, which, which was too big. There was, the, the set would, would have been too big. Um, or we would have done it partly and then solve it with visual effects, but that would mean a lot of green screen, blue screen keying. And then maybe, um, you know, you go into this um, um, uh, route where you have this per shot cost for match moving, rotoscoping, keying, like all, all these uh, visual, tra more traditional visual effects uh, tasks. So um, in this case, virtual production seemed to be a very uh, nice alternative. So we started modeling one of these uh, parliamentary uh, spaces, the, the, the Senate or uh, the House of Representatives, I think it's the Senate. Um, and this is um, a time lapse. We don't work this fast, unfortunately, uh, of, uh, of that space. And it's very modular. So once you have one bench, you can kind of repeat it and make some changes. And this is the more familiar one of the two. You might recognize this. This is what it looks like in, looked like in 1992. And uh, yeah, you could say this is a game level of the Dutch parliament in a way. And once you have this, you can also, of course, you know, pick any angle, etc. What I'm about to show you next is the rushes that the crew took home with them at the end of the shooting day. So nothing has been done. There's no grading, there's no editing. It's just like the in-camera end results. And on the right, as a comparison, there's a, a small slideshow showing you photographs of what the set looked like to give you an idea of how big or small the set was during the shoot. So on the left, um, you see people walking in. There's a lot of journalists, which are extras. And basically, there's only this like large table and the rest, including, of course, the windows. What's outside the window is all part of the Unreal scene. And what we noticed during the shooting day, and this is a good example of flexibility and like real-time capabilities, we very much liked all these flashes coming from the photographs of the, of the extras. And we also added some of those, these flashes in Unreal, like these one, you know, uh, one frame flashes almost. So the foreground and the background, they get more, more and more like blended together. And that is one of the, um, um, well, not secrets, but it's one of the, uh, um, uh, formula parts of success for virtual production is to blend this foreign background together. And what you also see is how the outside reflects in the desk. Uh, we can just put glasses of water there, like things that you would normally avoid when using blue screen or green screen. Actually, you can embrace them with virtual production because they make um, the, the end result far more convincing. So these are handheld shots, obviously. Um, where everything works in tandem with uh, the, the camera dynamics. Again, water, reflective materials, people wearing glasses, all these things work uh, very nicely in virtual production. This is another example. What we see here is, um, see if this works, yeah. So we had some of these blue chairs that you see also here in Unreal. And of course, on the day of shooting, we found out that the blue of the production designer's chairs didn't match the blue in our Unreal scene. And due to the capability, the real-time capabilities of a game engine, you can select the blue in Unreal. You shift it a little bit so it kind of aligned with the blue in the background and then suddenly it worked um, as a seamless whole, which was nice. So um, the third location that we used virtual production on is this traffic tower, again from 1992. It was a very hard location to produce. They see the, the smoke on the horizon um, as the first people. We added like this 2D plane here on shot, so on the composition. And we found a very nice archival picture of uh, the airport, Schiphol, in 1992. And we could project that inside a, a large bowl. And when the camera goes up, like you see there, you can feel this like big distance, which is actually, of course, fake. We just put that in Unreal Engine to uh, kind of um, exaggerate that depth. And the same goes for this binocular shot. She's actually looking at a three by three mobile screen. So this is an in-camera final shot. So there's no post-production there needed to add these reflections in, which is quite powerful that you can do that like in-camera as an in-camera result. And this was, here you can see the size of the set, which is um, pretty modest. So you, you don't need that much. We did a lot of glass and things, again, because it's, also possible. So when we go back to this matrix, and these are the main markers, I think is 
the volume. There were about, I think, 16 pages of dialogue and uh, uh, screen, 16 pages, roughly 16 minutes, maybe 20 minutes of screen time, which is um, a very large amount of screen time to do normally with visual effects or virtual production really helped help that. Then we had impossible locations and ultimately that was also um, helping the, to reduce the cost. So another case study is um, Modern Love, which is a drama series that is an international drama series on Amazon Prime Video, but they made a Dutch original series. And one of the episodes take pl takes place in um, a village um, during Christmas, and they shot this last summer, ironically, on the longest day of the year. So you have the shortest night. If you know anything about uh, film production, then of course, like a short night to do a, a night shoot is a disaster because you have to fit everything into the few hours that you have. So what we wanted to do is actually create a virtual version of the film set that they already also shot in, which is a Dutch village called Marken. So we set out to propose to use photogrammetry for this. So to go out, take a lot of pictures of Marke. There's an explanation to photogram. I think a lot of you already know what photogrammetry is. Um, you take a lot of pictures of a location or object or whatever, and, and you can create a, uh, a, a 3D model, or in this case, a 3D scene from those photographs. And this is our VP supervisor, Robert, that went with his camera to this village. He waited every time with, you know, between the pictures until everybody had walked out of the frame. So it looks empty, but that's kind of an illusion. So 1,500 to 2,000 photos resulted in this very rough point cloud 3D model, which is nowhere near suitable for production. It's just to give you the measurements, to give you, you know, the right spacing, some kind of idea of what it should look like. Um, but we built the Unreal scene over this. So we at least we have a good, like we have a proper measurement of the place. We know um, where's what, but we, we need to kind of um, additionally also decorate it with um, the uh, Christmas decorations that were that was also kind of um, approved by the production designer. This is a short clip of what it looks like. So all the bokeh that you see in the background there, all the defocus, that of course happens in camera. So the screen, the unreal scene looks very clean. And that's also something when you're on set and you look at, the, at this uh, LED wall, um, then it looks pretty gamey. The unreal scene looks gamey because we don't add a lot of extra things that you would normally do in compositing, like maybe noise or flares or glows or uh, lens distortions, things like that. We just keep it clean because that happens all in the camera with which you shoot. So in this case, um, we had an impossible location because this village was not too keen on uh, receiving film crews and having their village decorated for Christmas in the middle of the summer. And uh, we had control for light and weather because uh, one of the things that they thought was very important is to have a lot of fog and atmosphere there. And if you try to do that outside, it blows away very fast. So in a confined, controlled environment of a studio, that works pretty good, actually. Um, then we have Van den Assem, which is a shoe brand. They had a very short commercial with a very clear pitch. They wanted to um, show how, you know, they, they wanted to go to a place that looked like the salt plains in, I think it's Bolivia or at least in South America. And um, they wanted to play with these reflections a lot. And this is also a good example of where traditional VFX would probably be very difficult to create this, uh, this type of uh, final look. So the production design team, they built a basin of a few meters, very low water, but they just give this nice shallow um, 15 by five, that's quite large, yeah, that's quite large. Took a whole night to fill uh, with water, yeah. Uh, so we have this very shallow um, layer of water where all the reflections um, uh, nicely came from the, the lead wall into that water surface. Um, and it's actually so short that I'm going to show you the commercial, the final commercial. Het 
gevoel waar je voor terugkomt. Van den Assen, schoenen die het verschil maken. So I think Niels, you already mentioned that they, you know, there is a seam as you could already see that in the photo. So there's this seam where the edge of the screen connects to the basin in the studio, and that seam was removed in post-production. So there is some visual effects involved here. So in this case, com coming back to this matrix again, impossible locations because uh, they wanted to shoot in Amsterdam, this uh, fast, these fast vistas, control over light and weather. And there is a sustainability factor here. Instead of going with a whole crew to South America, this was shot in a studio in Amsterdam. So that is a difference. Um, then we're going to um, a production that was released only last week, which is a music video that was shot at Ready Set for the Eurovision Song Contest uh, 2023, this year coming up. Niels. Yes. You are going to say something about this because I, you were on set. Yeah, and I love Eurovision. So let's... Uh, <laughs> Having said that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is a, a perfect example of something that has been um, shot three weeks ago, maybe four, and released last week. So it was a really fast turnaround. Production F in 12 days, I think. It, yeah. Like yeah. So from the inception of the idea and the first conversations to the release, I think it, was, it couldn't have been more than three weeks. No, we no. did five or six virtual locations. Exactly. We, so we did six virtual locations in two days of shooting and one day of pre-lighting. Um, it's a little bit of a behind-the-scenes uh, uh, film where you see a lot of people thinking and collaborating and communicating with each other and trying to figure out how to do all these difficult shots because that was really the point. It was a lot of difficult shots happening in a very short time frame. So I think the concept was that there was a central space yeah. with a lot of doors and they want to yeah. go in and out into different exactly. locations that were not so, yeah. connected in real, could, could not have been connected in real life. The story of the, of the video clip is uh, both the, uh, the male and the female have their own separate emotional voyage to, to take and uh, she's fighting with her parents and he's breaking up with his girlfriend and every time they uh, center in um, an area with uh, six doors and they go through a different door every single time coming into a different location so for her it's a, a living room with her parents at the table another door shows her mother screaming at her and for him he goes to a bar uh, sitting with his uh, ex-girlfriend, I guess, uh, and then they go into their uh, into his sleeping room, and there was also a shot that never made it to the clip where they were sitting in a car drinking champagne, and at one point they meet each other back in that room full of doors, and obviously um, they don't go through a different door every single time because they need to end up at the LED screen every single time, uh, but we create the illusion that they are actually doing that. Um, this is the final clip, by the way. I'm just okay. you know, showing so that in the, the background. This is the final clip. It's called Burning Daylight. He's called Dion and she's called Mia. And they're going to go uh, represent Holland on the Eurovision Song Contest. But the, uh, the whole idea of doing this in virtual production, because that's what we are talking about, is efficiency. There was virtually no, <laughs> no pun intended, no time to, uh, to shoot this. They had three days. They could have done this in real locations, but that would have meant five company moves. So five times the whole crew, not alone, you know, left alone that they needed to find those locations, but going to location, doing a pre-light, setting everything up, etc., etc. And right now they can do it in the confined space of a studio with a crew that was not very experienced. Um, and a director that had never worked with virtual production. Uh, I think the only person that had experience from this crew was the DP, which obviously... Catering. And the catering. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, but everybody gave it their absolute best because they knew that this was like their moment to shine. So even the, uh, the singer, uh, both male and female, they just came in, they said, all right, I'm just going to hand myself over to you and just tell me what to do. 
And at the end, and you'll see this uh, at another making of that will be released somewhere this week, I guess, by Brut Amsterdam, who was our uh, client. Um, at the end, everybody was so emotional. There was actually hugging and tears. That's how powerful this all was. Um, so when you, obviously for us, when we look at the end result, we look at the video clip and try to think, in this case, try to think, do I believe the end result? Do I believe that it's, uh, that it's happening somewhere else than a studio because we all know and you all know now that it was shot in a virtual production studio uh, but honestly 95 percent of the time i actually believe it and that is because it was all blending together the backgrounds that were created were looking really good on camera uh, the foregrounds and the midgrounds and the lighting it all came together as one and i think are we at the end of this? Uh, yeah, well, so we, yeah. you know, we, we, we cross-checked this with <laughs> exactly. the final thing, which you yeah. already mentioned. Kind exactly. Of the thing. So there was impossible locations. Well, the locations itself was, weren't impossible, just, just the logistics of those locations. So it was an efficient shoot. There was control over light and weather because it needed to be happening uh, in the middle of the night and also at uh, daytime and et cetera, et cetera. Flexibility, obviously, it was all happening in the control space of a studio. They could instead of going, you know, taking a door with them to locations, they could just build that set on, uh, in the studio and use it uh, to trick our brains. And let's be honest, for this one, um, the cost was a very big factor yeah. as well. And the discount. Yeah. And the and discount. The <laughs> no, so um, just before we go into some uh, questions and to wrap it up, the recipe for success, um, this is uh, a little bit of a shortcut, of course, because there's a lot more involved, but these are, I think the main markers is uh, you have, you need a proper set, which is the foreground, but also the midground. So what happens directly after your initial foreground, maybe some extras, maybe some props to blend the foreground and the content, which is on screen, which is obviously a very important part of any virtual production, uh, production to have a really uh, convincing virtual set, set extension, and then light is the one that kind of ties one and two together. So every uh, production, every uh, pre-production should be um, um, uh, properly planned also with meeting all the creative stakeholders, with meeting everyone who's involved on set. So not only the DOP and, uh, sorry, not only the director and, and, and the producer, but also the DOP together, like everybody who is involved that has something to say or to do with what we will see later on set is very important. And the last thing is communication because this is the, the, the thing also if we reach out or speak to other virtual production studios in the world, even the like the, the really high end ones, they all say communication is the one, like one of the biggest challenges. And we are also learning every time with every production how this can be improved. Absolutely. And it's not only communication on set, it's also communication on beforehand between all departments. They all need to come together. They all need to have their, you know, their ducks in a row and have their, you know, their the end vision in mind. And then obviously on set communication is really, really important yep. as well. True. Um, I realize we've only done 3D examples. Right. Instead of uh, car plates. Or yeah, something. car plates yeah. or 2D. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 true. Okay. But still, it's about the, I think <laughs> yeah. it's about it's about the, the whole process. process. But we showed you. Yeah. You can also do 2D in 2.5D. <laughs> um, are there any questions? Oh, oh sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> can you just ask me to ask you to answer? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my question is exactly on your last point, the communication. So um, in this kind of um, company and line of business where there are a lot of different background involved, both technical uh, from like a development perspective, uh, artistical, uh, both digital and, and analog, let's say, um, how do you manage to uh, have a good communication between all these different uh, departments or backgrounds also, individual backgrounds? That's actually a really good question and it's actually a big challenge as well. I'll, I'll hand it over to Dennis. It's actually a big challenge as well. Luckily, um, 
most manufacturers that we work with um, are into the business or have did come into the business of making films. Manufacturers so, yeah. sorry. So yeah, the main. Yeah, well, the manufacturers. So, Unreal Engine, for example, is using the same terminology as we are using on set. Um, and lately, even LED processors have started to implement, uh, for example, stops into their uh, into their uh, uh, UIs. Uh, but it is it's a challenge. And then, especially uh, you know, from a, from the digital standpoint, you you're looking for people with both experience in game design, working in Unreal Engine or any other game uh, engine, uh, but also having a, a, a keen eye for film, let's, let me put it that way, and an interest in film, obviously, in, in working in film, because it's, you know, let's be honest, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's, it's set life. So it's, uh, it's exciting to some, but it's not exciting to anybody, to everybody. Um, so yeah, it is a challenge. Um, we hope that we are figuring things out uh, currently with uh, new roles being implemented, um, with heads of department, with a virtual production supervisor, like you had used to have a VVEC supervisor, or still have a VVEC supervisor, but have a virtual production supervisor. There's communication between the art department, virtual art department, and the director and the DP, and so on. So you're, we're creating new roles on set um, to help this because there is no real answer, unfortunately, at the moment. Does that answer your question? Thank you. <laughs> there, in the back. A, a, a more remark or an addition than a, than a question on a topic of communication, because I think I'm going to take a wild guess and think that we're with a lot of more technical people in the room rather than filmmakers, I'm not sure. Um, but I think it's important for us all to realize that for filmmakers, this is such a different way of working than they've always done. So that communication is also really about creating a space to be vulnerable and be open about this is super new to us. We do not know what this is. We are filmmakers. We've done this for ages. How does this work nowadays? And I think that that's really the infancy stage that we're in right now is makes that extra important. You're very right, and thank you for uh, for the addition. It is uh, it is very important for everybody to realize that it's it's new. So also for the very old fashioned DPs and directors, as well as for the very young. Uh, digital artists, they need to come together and, and trust each other on their own specialty. Now, having said that, uh, there's a lot of old-fashioned filmmakers that are really scared about using virtual production. And what we find is that we, for example, on the flights, there was a DP that really was a bit hazardous of using virtual production, but it was within two hours of the shoot that he realized his, his mind was blown. You could see the exact moment that it happened, what, with all the possibilities that he had. And he, he just went completely berserk on, on, uh, you know, on, on communicating, on requesting new things on the spot. Uh, and, and for example, uh, you know, the, that little plane uh, in the flight control tower to be added. And then all of a sudden, you realize that it takes, you know, we say it, it takes, only takes a couple of minutes, but even a couple of minutes is then not fast enough because they want to see it immediately and want to do it now because everybody's so excited that it is possible. But again, communication. <laughs> it would have been great to have known that on beforehand. And uh, do we have a Discord server for IC <laughs> visual effects? Well, yeah. well done. Yeah, uh, so Philippe here from Ready Set again. Uh, we host also a Discord server uh, with a lot of people in there now, people from ILM, from Epic Games, uh, and all over the world, uh, studio owners, Unreal artists. Uh, so we really try to expand the virtual production uh, talks, and we uh, share a lot of knowledge there. And any question is a good question. We try to share as much as possible. So if you, if you go to the website, if you go to the website, you scroll down a little bit, you see the, the, like, how you can get onto this Discord server and join it, right? Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I think it's on the bottom of the page. Okay. And, uh, else, just uh, look in your Discord for IC Visual Effects. IC Visual Effects in capitals. Any more questions? If nobody has one, I actually... 
have one. All right. Um, Go ahead, Ella. This is very intense. Uh, <laughs> um, how do you deal with, um, if, you, if you're lighting your set, how do you deal with having lights that are pointing directly at your volume? Well, uh, that's, that's a big yeah. no-go. Yeah. You cannot so. have lights pointing at the LED screen yeah. point. Um, yeah, you, will, you can, but you have to flag them, basically, because yeah. any light hitting the LED screen, just the image is gone. So, yeah, that's um, a, I just wondered if you had, uh, that's a big thing that we struggle with, that's washing out. Gray. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's the most yeah. Like, yeah. obvious technical uh, effect of that. Sorry. No, no, no. The black levels turn gray when pointing a light at the LED screen. Yeah, so it screws up your maybe yeah. your color management or whatever you want to do later mm -hmm. also with grading. So that's yeah. why we have to make sure that we put some kind of like skirt or flag or whatever in between whatever light source you have and the, the back wall to hold that off. But it is a challenge sometimes because sometimes you need to light your subject in a certain way for the scene. And then yeah. you have to deal with it. It's one of the challenges. And the same goes, for example, when you have an LED ceiling. You know that also reflects on the back, back wall or on the side wall. Yeah. Sorry. We got that idea from you to have the black flag behind our yeah. ceiling panel, but uh, I'm gonna. Yeah. It was just because obviously on the sides we we flag it, but mm -hmm. it was just mainly if you had a trick for like directly in front for getting, uh, if you wanted a light from that specific position. Well, you can always light from position. the back, right? Have your yeah. lights on, you know, above and behind the main right. back wall. But yeah, it is a, it's, a, it's a difficulty. It's something that, uh, that, you know, there's no answer to, unfortunately. All right. Um, oh, sorry, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you very much <laughs> for Dennis, Niels, 